So, Chris, that's about what I got for you. I mean, I think I think it should give you enough enough ammunition. Well, I've got a lot of questions actually. Um, Carry on. I'm fascinated okay. between the Kufut and 101 Battalion because in the police, of course, Kufut was seen as the ultimate counterinsurgency. End of story. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they were also seen as very uh, strange people, actually. They, they had their own ways about them, which didn't always go well with the colonels who were steeped into, may I say, the English army tradition, you know. They were very strict people in, in certain ways, and Kufut operate differently. I just spoke to somebody, and he was he actually started a contract with, uh, which started the nine-day war. And he right. said to me, we had 10 teams there called in to assist them because there were just too many of these tours going on. And then he also said a very interesting thing, uh, Classy, that's his name. He said, this wasn't actually a Kufut battle because that contract went on for three, four hours. Mm -hmm. And that is army stuff. And I fully understand what they mean by saying that. And I think yeah. you people also. Now, how long would the, would the typical contract take place in time for, uh, for 101? So... On, on average, your, your contact time would be less than five minutes as a norm, right? Very similar to what the Kufit guys had. You'd run them down, they'd be so tired at the end, and you just shot them dead and moved on. The, the point behind it was that we ended up conventional a lot of the time. And when you ended up in that conventional, and what he said is right, those 10 teams, and they're all mixed with rattles. I, I, know, I know a little bit about the nine-day war. I, uh, 101 kept on phoning me and saying, you need to come back and come. And I'm, no, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm not. I'm not coming to do that. But the ten teams idea is exactly that. You end up that you got forty Caspers, and the big thing was that those swap boat tours were in groups of two to three hundred, and that's why you had to do that. If you had one one team of four Caspers, that have got wiped out, and that that was a clever strategy. The second reason that they were like that the first couple of days was they didn't have any machine guns; they only had the R fours. They'd been disarmed by Untag and were not allowed to have. 101 Battalion was gone. I mean, our Caspers were standing parked somewhere ready to get put on trains when they called everybody back. And Ben Fanta, the captain who took over 903 from me, he said, he was the one on the radio and on, on the Vamba radio and everything. Right, come back, boys. We've got a scrap on. And that's basically what happened. So we'd been disarmed and particularly Kufit had. And then luckily you had six me six one mech guys around there as well. But again, their role is more conventional than um, counterinsurgency, where the Kufrit guys were brilliant at that. And so were the 101 guys. I mean, the 101 trackers were brilliant. I mean, I had a little fat guy called uh, Oscar Kapunda in Romeo Mike, 8, Romeo Mike 8, and we got the spur of a couple of tours one day. 66 kilometers, that guy ran them down, and we killed him at the end of it. And this, this dude had 18 kids, you know, so... Uh, it's just how it was. All right, did that answer that one? Yeah, yeah. But you know what? You, you touched the walnut's knees here now because the Kufu guys also said they were supremely um, puzzled by 6-1 map because Kufu fought from the vehicles, the car, car, we call it car. Uh -huh. And they would not get down out of that vehicle unless they have to. And they, they said the 6-1 May guys were like totally weird. They would get out of their rattles and just go in as infantry. Now I need mm -hmm. to ask you, 101, fighting from the vehicles or infantry or both? From, the, from the vehicles. From the vehicles. The, guy, the guys who were on foot with the, with the trackers, they would melt out and the vehicles would come in and do all the damage. The same thing happened in the east. When we went to the east, originally Commandant Hotsley said to us, you guys are all infantry now. And we looked at him and laughed and said, really? We didn't even have helmets. <laughs> he says, yeah, you guys must do company attacks. He says, no bullshit. We don't do that stuff. We fight out of Caspers. That's how it is. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the 6-1 mech, what, what the difference is, they are conventional soldiers. Roland de Vries did a brilliant job. He's written some magnificent books, and he's a good guy. All right? But uh, they have a place in war. When we were out at the Lombo, certain times they had a place. Certain times they didn't. You know, when they were down in, in, in the farmlands at the bottom, when the first sort of areas uh, attacks went on on the farmers, three or four of their guys got killed, you know, again, because of this debussing out of the vehicles and all that sort of thing. Uh, you've got to adapt your tactics, and that's one of the reasons I really wanted to go to 101 was because of the way they worked.
Ne also looking for guys says my huge problems were with dikers. Right, it's a Casper with uh, five thousand liter water mm -hmm. or diesel. No, was on top. Of it. it just couldn't keep up. I said it was too heavy. I couldn't keep up with the turbo Caspers. Yeah. And later, those other vehicles I had, um, which replaced the Caspers. Yeah, my name is Caspers. Wolf. You know, wolf. Yeah, wolf. Yeah. The wolf. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. And he also was, he used to bait on what, which one of the two were the best because they said the wolf was too heavy and it yeah. would sink into sand. But then it had a very powerful main engine. Now, what I want to ask you out of I'm doing a thing between the two units is, is could your queer full as, as stay with you? Could could they go with all the way with your cash? Absolutely. Person? Yeah, but it was an air cooled Magiris Deutsch 352 ADE 352 engine, and they were damn good. You know, we, we didn't get the new ones, we got the old ones as well. So we would have the occasional problem with a few. Like when we were in the East, I had to bring back a whole lot of them that were sick, lame, and lazy, but it was a good vehicle. But we also didn't try and put 5,000 liters of diesel on it. We would, if we had to take diesel, we took a Quiffel 100, a SOM, uh, Quiffel 100, you know, the armor protected one, with 10,000 liters in it. And that thing, damn, that thing had a V12 Magiris Deutsch engine. You didn't play games with that. He could keep up anywhere you wanted to. Yeah, that's fantastic. But these these uh, support logistical vehicles were armed as well. They did have a machine gun there on them or not. Uh, sometimes we put an MAG on the top. With the bicycle wheel, but generally it was just the driver and his uh, number two and their R4s out the doors, and they would hang behind the Caspers. So they learned how to just follow the spur so they didn't really head into the contact. There's a few times that they did, but generally they wouldn't. They would uh, hang back because of that reason. And also, they had four drums of diesel on them, they had two drums of av Avtur on them, they had a diff for a Casper front, diff for Casper rear, diff for a Querful front, diff for a Querful rear. All your ammo, all your rations for five, six, seven weeks, whatever it was, all the troops backpacks went in there. They didn't live inside the Caspers. That bicycle uh, contraption for the machine gun, I just want to explain to people who might not know what uh, you sure. mean. It was on top of a turret uh, to the side, to the left of a driver, and, and you had like uh, handles, and then the LMG would shoot you on your head yeah. very inaccurately. And besides that, all the brass would come down on you. Man, you suffered down there. It was it was like being in yeah. burn. It was dreadful. Um, yeah. I I can quite understand why you got rid of it and put it right in front of a let's call it a co-driver through a windscreen. I mean that would have worked much better. And also, of course, at the back, because you had superb views from there on the top, didn't you? Yes, but the, the the big thing behind it was that the guy was able to at least use a machine gun. You know, so if you got burnt a little bit, that was life. Uh, they were the original. I mean, uh, Kufert also used the bicycle contraptions on the original Caspers. So they'd have one MAG on top of it and then the bicycle wheel inside with the two handles and what you did. Um, but as it developed later on, I mean, the Querfuls, if they'd used their brains eventually, which they didn't, we would have had window brownings in them, for example. Um, but that was just an afterthought, you know. Was it possible with that browning next to you in the, let's say, the co-driver seat to shoot your own bonnet? Not that it would matter his armor, but it couldn't bend down far enough? No. Couldn't do it. You had to lift that machine gun up so high to try and get it down. So, no. So, what's the combat range of a typical 101 group team in, in terms of, of, of range of diesel? Because what I found is that the South African designed vehicles are much more able to go further on diesel and would be a European or American one because of tails. Um, yeah. They have money and, uh, <laughs> you know, to do the logistic things, we don't. So gener generally a Casper on its 200 liter tank could do about 400, 400 kilometers, 450 kilometers. But it also depended how thick the sand was and whether you were stopping and waiting for to find spur and idling and all of that. I mean... Val and all the guys who were there before me and uh, during the time I was there, they went right up to Kuvalai with those things. So you just learned. I mean, we, we got resupplied from the air quite frequently as well. Diesel. Yeah, that's a good thing, actually. That's a good thing. Yes. But, but now may I ask you, how did you get those uh, fuel from the drums into your vehicles? Because a Casper's fuel cap is flipping eight feet in the air. 
Yeah, but you put, you park the quiffle right next to it, and the quiffle's high enough, and you put the one drum on top of the other, and then you siphon it in with a hose pipe. <laughs> <laughs> you teach, teach these guys know, the the guy sucking the diesel it's like no you blow the diesel and then it'll come out oh okay it's like you try and teach these youngsters today about how you pour out of a jerry can they haven't got a clue man they haven't got a clue you don't ever pour it straight out where it goes glug glug you turn it to the side and uh, let, it, let it run so that it, it has air all the time man that's clever that's clever I do seem to remind myself of having a hand pump and about 10 constables doing a 200 of a <laughs> pumps and three hours later, you're still only half full. You know? <laughs> yep. We never thought of it, but anyway. Uh, from a technical viewpoint, uh, Peter, what, what oil did you use on your on your machine guns and other weapons? Three in one or, or whatever you could find? Um, I can tell you right now that diesel is the best cleaning agent. For machine guns and the reason for this south african diesel is 500 ppm sulfur in america it's only 50 ppm so it doesn't work here right so for cleaning there was that and then we would generally use sae 30 or something like that and example most people don't understand that a machine gun that piece of steel is moving up and down so fast it's incredible so for example i would make my mag gunners carry a gill bottle, a little those little gill bottles of shampoo with oil inside it. As soon as you hit the contact, first belt out, you pour oil in the top of it and it'll just carry on going. There's a question which I really hope you can answer to me. I want to know why is the mag gunners, the light machine gun gunners, always on the flanks when you walk a patrol? Why not up front? The reason for it is so that you can flank the enemy. So what you do is as you hit the main contact, your gunner and the number two will always move around to the side when they're told by the patrol commander, and they then give you the covering fire for you to go and attack them from the front. Would, would, would 101 also be um, circling and, and mauling when they find the enemy yes. shoot inside like a... Yeah, very, very much. Happened in the east as well with the tanks. When you're running around and there were Caspers driving around behind tanks trying to tell rattles to shoot tanks out, it was like, oh, man. Crazy stuff. Um, the, the general was we didn't maul as much as what Kufu did because for them, the contact was so quick, so short and done. For us, we would end up sometimes in an extended line. And if you do that, then you try and do the maul. Then you've got 14 Caspers running into each other. It's just counterproductive, really. I am told, and if, if I'm wrong, please, uh, you people listening, uh, tell me in a polite way. Because remember, if you make not comments on legacy, I chase you away, man. I, I don't hesitate. We're all friends here. We're all comrades. We're all veterans, man. So anyway, they, they tell me that even to this very day, you can see where a uh, where 101 or um, 61 Mach or a uh, Kufut team went through the bush. They say they just banged their way through. You can see the damage are still there. And I don't mind the damage. I'm not a greenie. I'm just saying... Trying to explain to you how these vehicles would be used. Uh, you would you would see it, particularly if you had a convoy of a company. So if you looked at the photographs that Helmut Hol Holmer Reitman uh, put out out of the east, the Lombo River, all those rattle tracks, that gives you the idea. So you'd bundabash the trees down, and then everybody else would follow behind that. Um, you can see it, yes. Uh, it'll grow back eventually, but I mean, there's so much bush there, it doesn't make any difference. So for the greenies, they can keep themselves happy about that. We'll just buy a Greta another cell phone or something. Yeah, let's not go on to them. You know, they're actually <laughs> classified as terrorists, by the way, uh, by the FBI, these, these greenies. So, yeah. um, I wrote about it in a few books, much to be disgust. Now, you said the brain was an extremely accurate <clears throat> accurate rifle and I, I recall some World War II veterans tell me I was a child and I was still alive but actually that was a damn problem according to them to these worms with a brain it was too accurate they couldn't um, according to them shoot at, at lots of people at the same time uh, I, 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 I'm not sure how I feel about that argument of them uh, how do you feel about it no you just got to move the, uh, the back of the machine gun left to right that's basically it so, no, on that point of view, no. I don't think that's an accurate thing. Yeah, I think we were having me on, man. I think we were having me on. 
Uh, you said you were making fires at night, the same as Kufu begging, you know, praying to be attacked. But were you actually attacked? Because Kufu says they were solemnly attacked. The terrorists were not that stupid. No, they, they were very scared to come and do it because they knew that the next morning you'd pick their spur up and within 20 kilometers you'd have them. So as a rule, not, not that I ever knew of, okay? But I'm pretty sure that it probably happened somewhere along the line. But you must remember, as the war progressed, the Typhoon Tours got better and better and better. That day, that day they killed McCann. Those guys were so anti-vehicle anti armed, it was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. The one guy had 28 SKS rifle grenades for anti-tank on his webbing. Uh, and another one had a whole lot for AKs. There was RPG-75s, RPG-7s, you name it. They were just waiting for us to do that. So they, they would try and taunt you as well, you know. Yeah, that was the thing. I mean, if I could get you an ambush and shoot your vehicle out, then, uh, then, then the fight is, is, is more oh, equal. Yes. Oh, yes. That's why the PKM is such a great machine gun, because of its armor-piercing bullets. I mean, that Casper of McCann's, they shot the diff out, the transfer case out. There were bullet holes everywhere. There's just oil pouring out of it. Am I right if I save a PKM, it's a machine gun? Um, it uses what they, what they call the Soviet um, 306. Yeah, 762 by 54 mil. That's the one. It's the same same round as the Dragonov and the Gurunov. They all use that same round. And it's good. It's a very good round. Well, again, one of the reasons that the 303 was such a great rifle was the heavy bullet. So when you hit somebody, it dragged him down. Uh, where with the 556, five, you shoot him, it goes through. It does massive damage, but you don't knock him down. That was the whole reason behind the 303 being such a uh, an effective weapon. So this is all about firepower, isn't it? I mean, you mount the most heaviest and uh, the mostest machine guns you can, even cannon if you can on that case, but and when your contact hits, you just open up and, and empty. Well, you shoot selectively as well. You don't want to just waste it. That's that's one of the things. The guys tried a lot of Hispano Suiza cannons. Uh, they tried AGS 17s, for example. Um, there were different varieties of weapons that were put out, but it, it came down to the end where the 5 0 Browning and the 3 0 Browning were actually the better choice of the whole lot. So, firepower, Basically. yes. Uh, it's a very big thing. I mean, the way we, we trained our guys, uh, particularly when we were going into Angola and then into the east, was we did a thing called a Fiechord a fire belt action. So you would drive down the road, everybody would swing left at the same time and just open up. And you have 14, 16, 18 vehicles just laying out 200 rounds out of each machine gun that they've got. I mean, the the, the effect is super impressive. How did you load these, these weapons, the tracer to ball? Uh, generally, the 4 to 1 principle. Gener generally. Uh, the, the problem with using tracer in Angola was you lit the bush on fire all the time, and that became an issue for you. But gen generally, it came already made of 4 to 1. Okay, so tell me, uh, there are people who say that the 5 Browning shoots a lot slower than, say, the 303 or the 7.62s. But that's relative, mate. That's relative, isn't it? Yes, but the, the 5 Browning, you just got to adjust how your barrel click goes. That's all it is, nothing else. No, if you don't know how to do it properly, it doesn't work. So when I got to the east, I had Roman Mike 14 Casper, and that thing it had a trigger problem all the time. So you had to wiggle the trigger all the time to get it to shoot. But if you set that thing on to um, S for Super, out it went. Well, one of the battalion also the same as Kufut, where they would call a group after the, the, the first members. So you had like Zulu, Juliet, Zulu, uh, Quebec, whatever. No, no. no. The Romeo Mike companies were 901, 902, 903, 904. Each one had four teams. So you'd have Roman Mike 1 to 4 in in uh, 901, Roman Mike 5 to 8 in 902, 9 to 12 in 903, and then 904 was uh, 13 to 16. And then your company commander had his call sign. So my call sign was Golf Bravo, Duval was Delta Whiskey, John Ramod was Papa Lima, 
um, Sace Princeton was Sierra Papa, and that was that was just done so you had a differentiation. It wasn't oh nine hundred one. This is are, are you on the line? Now the two kennels, as you refer to them, wonderful chaps, by the way. Um, they told me they had this little book as a non-commissioned officer, and then they would tick down, you know, jump up and down and see if you're rattling before you go and patrol, uh, fill your water bottle. One guy made a comment there, and it's like, because <laughs> I don't know the answer of that. Yet. He, he made a comment, okay, what do you do then when your water, pool, water bottle is half full? Are you going to start rattling now? How do you overcome this? <laughs> Any you, suggestions? You yeah, you drink it all. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, the, the whole thing behind it, that, that's for foot soldiering. So at the end of the day, if you're going out on a patrol, you don't want to be rattling and clanking and making a noise all the time. So the whole the, the whole point behind the noise check is, one, to check that you're not going to drop anything, but number two, to check that you're not going to make a noise, you know, like the MAG belts rattling against each other or anything like that. So, yeah, when it comes to the water bottle, if it's half full, you empty it. That's it. But water was actually a problem there. I mean, that's what uh, the Casper said. I think a 200-liter water tank on them as well. Were yes. you using that or were you using the ones on the um, Quayful or both? No, no, we used the water water in the Caspers. That was all. I mean, if you go back to the east, Hotsleaf called us in after we'd been there for about 55 or 58 days and says, you 101 officers stink. What's wrong with you lot? So now we haven't had a bath yet. He said, why? So because we never get the water bunkers. They arrive at us and we can fill our water tank and our water bottles and that's it. No, you better have a bath. Go to rivers. No, there's crocodiles in there. Lots of them. <laughs> and leeches. Okay, but how would it work? I'm, I'm quite fascinated by this. How would it work before you go out on a patrol? And how long is this patrol anyway? Would you have like an order group so you know where you're going and then it goes down? I was say that Peter is nodding in the background, but tell us, please, I want to know, and do you then line up the vehicles and do a quick inspection, or do you trust the main, the experienced fighters, uh, they will do the right thing? Your your platoon sergeant does all of that for you at the beginning. So your team team sergeant, he's the man who will check and make sure they've got all the ammo and all the rations and all the water and all the other things that you need. Uh, yes, there are order groups. Uh, with the style of fighting that 101 did, you had order groups, yes. So if you're doing a proper attack, then you had a proper order group. That was you sat down and you went right from admin, you know, uh, everything from the beginning to the end, command and signals, admin and log, you name it at the end. But uh, as a norm, quick convoy orders were very simple to do and easy to do. And you'd already taught the guys when we went to the Panikis Flakters about the Fir Kordel Axi, what you had to do if you had to do a fish card, you know, fish bone to go under the trees if the MIGs were around. All that sort of thing. So it becomes instinctive. And as you're working with older soldiers, it's easier to do. The reason that the people like uh, Naughty Cars and 61 Mech and all of them do the style parade is to make sure that their guys have what they got. And I'll just give you an example. Right at the beginning of the border war, there was a guy who was supposed to carry a spare barrel, uh, or sorry, supposed to carry a brand gun. And he walks around with the spare with the spare barrel sticking out his coat. And when they get back, he says, where's the brand gun? Oh, no, it's in the base. <laughs> No, so <laughs> there's there's all that sort of thing. You you got the jipper kata who do that stuff. So you got to check on it. But if you give a, give a good set of orders, you you can normally sort out what you need to. And the platoon sergeants they were really good at that. In in the RAR, for example, it was a platoon warrant officer who did that. I must say that God will not have mercy on that fellow with his brain at all. <laughs> Um, God knows, I don't know if this actually happened or not, because there's lots of such rumors, but it happened yeah. to me once. I mean, I were two days in a patrol and the driver comes to me. But you know what? This guy was actually fantastic. He was a detective, an older guy. He served in Rhodesia in the part two units. So we had on his camera, we had the part two sticks, you know, so I really looked up to him. I mean, this guy was like experienced. And he said to me, uh, Sergeant, um, you know, I, uh, I forgot my rifle at the camp. <laughs> The bus, the fork. So I just gave you my nine million, know, and I said, "Well, I don't want to know, man. I'm just ignoring this. I don't want to know." But all sorts of things went through my head. Mm -hmm. I mean, but right. um, I, I was comes there. Were your radios up to scratch? Could you guys talk to each other and also air support yes. and, and everyone? Yeah, we had we had very good comms. We we used the TR48 Hopper, and then we then we had the B B20 or. 
B-53s, I think it was, mounted in the Caspers, and we had antenna with blow, blow coils and all sorts of things. So the comms were very good. And, and your comms of a driver during a contact, what is that? A, a kick in the head to turn left and a kick on the other side of the head? That's you it. You work that out? No, you just tell him, Ray links, Ray links. Ray Rex or Coludio, Colomesho or whatever it was. And if he didn't do it, you kicked him in the head and he knew that he had to go to that side next. That was how it was. I always ask the Kufit members this. So I want to ask you as well. What is the record to change a Casper wheel? A flat wheel which got shot out. How quick can you change that thing? Normal T, I just want to tell people, it's a flipping heavy wheel. It's big. It is tightly Probably, probably around long. 15 minutes. Yeah, probably 15 around minutes. 15 minutes. You know, what it's happens is when you have a lot of team members, they all just climb in and they know. So that day McCann was killed. They shot both of my spare wheels out on the back of my Casper. Both of them. Luckily, I didn't shoot any of my wheels out, but the back the back two wheels were gone. And when I got there to go and uh, drop McCann's body at the uh, chopper pad and Mark, Mark Suter, they basically ripped them off, sorted them out, put them back on, and off we went again to go back to the contact. What's the effect of that, of having to carry your own dead back to the to the chopper pad of a base? I mean, do the guys have time to think about it, or do they think about it later? They think about it later. But 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 you must remember that the Ovambos were very uh, rural people, right? And for them, life and death is no issue. So when we got McCann back to the chopper pad and we put him out, put him down on the floor onto the onto the ground sheets. The troops were already stripping his boots off and everything else. And Michael Ford went ape shit. He just was like, you bum, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you lot there, get away from him and leave him alone. Uh, that's just how life is. You know? it's, in, in that situation, that's what you have. Yeah, I know that the cavalry guys, they had the same problem. I mean, a horse would get shot or executed because it'd break a leg and then the bombers. <clears throat> or the local guys just want to eat it. And they were like, man, mm -hmm. this is like eating your police dog. You can't. You can't do that. I mean, <laughs> but but it's it's different cultures. I mean, we have to understand yeah. it. it. It's not the same. It's not the same everywhere. No, yeah. I just want to say to you yeah, at the end, I'm really grateful you 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 clarified that mag story with the um, Rhodesians, uh, because there was quite a bit of feeling about that. You know, these mags can be used can be used against yes. us. So I'm glad you 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 cleared that up. And then lastly, I want to ask you, you know, when you were ambushing those mix and Sukhois, they were your burning tires. Did you ever get anyone? Did you ever get one? No, we, we would have got closer if we'd been had Sam Sevens in, in at the Lomba. Uh, but they did come flying by, but they also knew to stay way above the, I think the Sam's effective height is 7,000 meters, somewhere effective range. So they always stayed at 10,000, whatever happened. So they'd fly by. You could hear them and you could see them in the in the sky, but no. We personally, I didn't have any. The other guys maybe, but I don't think we ever shot shot down a Nick. I heard that they were tracking you uh, with Caspers on the radar. I, I had a Kufit member with us once uh, on a range, and one of the mirages or something came through the uh, through the clouds, and this guy just man, he wasn't waiting. He was going down and he was just moving away and he was grabbing me with no clue why or what he was doing. In fact, I thought he was trying to assault me in a very strange way. And, and then he sat down and he smoked a cigarette and says, Chris, no, 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 we know those mix track you through the clouds, man. You hear that thing, the bombs are already dropping and you got to run. Um, true? Or was he taking me for... for, they, for they, they, they didn't track us. They could see us from the tracks that we made. So, you know, one, one of the things that a lot of uh, white people don't understand about being fighting in a bush war is that when there's a broken tree stump, it's white. There's nothing white in the bush. So when you look from the air, you will see broken pieces and it's all white all the time. That's how they pick you up. So when we were in the east, we had that. Uh, they would follow us because they could see the spur. You know, there were like 40 vehicles driving on the same spur. So it was easy to pick us up. It's just if your camouflage was good, they couldn't find exactly where you were. Except the one day when me and Duval and the troops were sitting there and it was a SU-22 pilot and he had a red star on the, on this helmet. And we were sitting around the Caspers and that night we decided we're not digging trenches. This is a pain in the ass. We've been doing this for far too long. So we're sitting all talking BS at the back end of the Casper. 
And the next minute, the mid goes by, and then we hear him coming back. It's like, oh, shit, boys, you better run. And about 70 meters away, 500-pound bomb he dropped, uh, dropped near us. So they, they tracked us through our own, let me put it as not stupidity, but our, our own vehicle movements and all that. That was how they did it. Yeah, you're quite right about that because I, I spoke to some of the, the Reikis and they said as this Dayglow story didn't work as well as white. They could just use the back of their maps and the Impala pilots would pick them up at 12, 15,000 feet. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, well, in Rhodesia, when they went on the externals, that was how they were able to pick up where the camps were. Through the radar photographs, there were suddenly these patches with whole white dots all over the place. And that made it easy to suddenly, oh, okay, look here. And then you started to see the trench formations and all that. Looking back now, what what was the major difference between the Rhodesian army and the South African one? The South Africans had far more resources and the South Africans were very much more conventional as, as an army, right? Where the Rhodesians learned to adapt. They learned right at the beginning so the police were the first guys into the into the war and that went on. And then suddenly they realized at that first contact in 1966 or whatever it was, they suddenly realized, wow, we're far out of our death. We need we need the military to do that. Um, I think that the main difference between the Rhodesian army and the South African army was how the leader group were trained. So for me, I believe they did a great job of training the young leaders, but they didn't do enough to help them um be super officers they were super soldiers but not super officers where in Rhodesia their whole scheme was you are going to be the best that you can for those troops so that you can lead them and show them what to do and how you do it and that for me was a very big uh, differentiation the Rekis was different Rekis had a very good uh, setup and a good training program and a good way of doing things uh, the regular army was slightly different you know I mean, when I trained that last company at 1 to 1 Battalion, we had to do mine, uh, Sukstirk drills to look for mines. And like, come on, guys, you know, then you're going to put this orange flag out and then do the next thing and the next one. And if the guy put the Sukstirk in at the wrong angle, you fail. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I asked the generals here at the SADF often whether they actually cared for their people or not. And they all are very adamant they did. I mean, they did care for me. Um, but sometimes an officer to me was a very aloof thing. It was quite unapproachable. Is, is that what you mean? Would, would you be able to... Was the Rhodesian style more like the Israeli one, but more informal, perhaps? More informal, I would agree with that. I think I think that your officers were very approachable because you worked in four-man sticks. You must remember in South Africa, minimum was 10 guys in a section. And then when things got really bad, they were walking in platoon patrols. So you had 34 people. That's the difference uh, between it. One of the problems, I believe, South Africa-wise, and I'm not an expert on it, okay? I just uh, observed certain things, was that before the Second World War, um, a lot of civil service guys were drafted into the military to boost the military numbers. And that, I think, is one of, where one of the problems came from. The second thing is that if you are aloof, so one of the things in the in the RAR, for example, the soldiers would test you. They, you got a nickname, and it was only after you got a nickname and you were accepted would they actually listen to what you wanted. Otherwise, they would do everything the platoon warrant officer did. So it was a very different intimacy in terms of how that worked. Uh, 101 was very good in that term. Your officers, corporals, Lieutenants, colonels, it didn't matter who you were. You could fight, you could fight. That's all they wanted to know about. Um, in the regular army, the whole discipline thing comes in and there's a very uh, staid regimental procedure, you know. Well, it's true what you say, because I believe there by 1961, the early 60s, the South African army went nuts, politically-wise. Not, not the soldiers themselves, I mean the guys from the top. Yeah. Where they got these ranks of felt cornet and God knows what else. And they got rid of all the World War II experienced officers simply because they were English. Tough thing for me to say, but that's exactly what happened. And they lost that expertise. Because yeah. once these guys went, they went. Yeah, look, uh, 
when when we came to South Africa from Rhodesia, it was also a very difficult thing. We were all regarded as the enemy, you know, uh, speaking the tale of the devil and all these other things along the way. But you learn to overcome and you learn to mix in and do. There are some bad Rhodesians as well, same as there's some bad South Africans, you know. At the end of the day, that's just how life is. Um, but at the end of it, I think one of the things that really got me was how much in the Rhodesian army they taught us to care for our troops. So I was reading a thing, a friend of mine, Captain Russell Fulton, who was at 3RAR with me and then at Zimbabwe Military Academy. He's in Australia now. He writes a whole lot of things about the RAR and about the awards, the, the bravery awards and all that. And he was writing up today about his uh, platoon warrant officer, well, the company sergeant major, actually. And when he got to RAR, they made him uh, you know, go and meet everybody. And the CSM was in his store, and he made sure that he was, yes, sir, how are you, and all that. And two days later, the CSM asked, no, can I go on patrol with uh, Lieutenant Fulton? And, of course, the captain was like, mm, okay, yeah. And Fulton was dead, dead terrified. Now, now you've got a 15-year-old veteran who's coming on a patrol with you. He's going to check you out and see what you're doing and where it went. Long story short, this this particular guy was a goop magnet. And apparently the first two weeks that they were out, they killed seven tours. Now, in Rhodesia, that was pretty good, pretty good uh, odds and captured two and all that. And on one of the contacts, the PWO or the CSM, the company sergeant major, had shot one of the tours with a 42 Zulu rifle grenade in the back. So Russell says to him, so why did you use that? He says, if it's a big terrorist, you use a big, big stick. So Russell then wrote that. So what happened was they got back after the, after the two-week deployment, and the next minute, the company sergeant major walks into Russell's um, office, bangs his heel in, salutes him smartly and all the rest, and he says, sir, so manja manja, which is the name of your platoon, readily accept you, you are now one of them, and you can tell them what to do. <laughs> and that's that's how it worked. And, and a lot of that happened, not so much radically like that in 101, but a very similar sort of thing. Once they saw that you were capable, you were um, like gold to them. Was that the same in the Zulu Battalion, one-to-one? -one? Yes, uh, to, yes, to a large degree. My, my man in one-to-one -one was Song Jumase, which is the man who does things himself because I wouldn't trust anybody to make sure it was right. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed this, man. I really appreciate it. I think we're going to call you back for a few things. I've got quite quite a few ideas still. So thank you for your time and enjoy your time there where you live, where you can have as much weapons as you please. I always found that fascinating, a fascinating place. Uh, I mean, yes. it's worth your while to just go there just for that, man. It's a pretty unbanned in that country. I would have had a collection but uh, yes. thanks. Thank you appreciate so much it. as well. Yeah, I really appreciate it as well. And I'll do more if you want to talk more about weapons. Or uh, One of the things that we did on our cadet course in Rhodesia was we, we were the first uh, cadet course that had T-55 tanks. So when we did our classical war exercise, we did a full company or full battalion attack with a, two squadrons of uh, uh, T-55 tanks. So yeah, we, had, we had a lot of good experiences. Yeah, we would love to hear all of them because there's a story where you got those T-55 tanks from as well, which is a very, very good story. I think me and Tony Bellinger, uh, we, we we spoke about that briefly, but we can speak about that. No, you're always welcome, Peter. And the, the, one guy of my, the one guy from my cadet course, he went and became the troop commander for the T-55. Well, I hope we can get all of him as well. That, that would be great. Because... I, I don't know if you're talking, but, but who knows? Yeah, we know right, because I you. know there was there was a problem with those tanks. Also, they painted them a wrong color or something. Something about infrared and the color they painted them or the paint they used. I don't know if that's true. That's what we heard. Some something to do with it. That's one of the reasons it got picked up in the harbor. Was that was the wrong colors of the tanks, and then also one of them where the canvas had blown off on the corner, and it was like, oh wow, look what's under here. Yeah. So what what they they actually they got ten of them. South Africans kept two and sent us eight. And one of them is actually standing there at uh, the War Museum in Saxon World. You can actually go yeah. and look at it. I sat on one on the amazing vehicle. Very, very good. It's an impressive looking tank. But uh, we have yeah. to stop talking now. Sadly, yeah. so, my man. So as we say here at uh, Legacy, God bless you all until we meet again. Thanks, Chris. Be good. Have a good day. See you.